We're out in the middle of the desert. Out, I mean, literally, a hundred miles from anything. We spot a vehicle driving across the desert with its headlights on, and, and this is mid in the middle of the night. It's actually a very dark night. The guy shows, drives up, and he's he's claiming there was an accident somewhere on the highway, and he wanted to look at the all the vehicles and ensure that that the vehicle, one of our vehicles weren't, wasn't involved in this accident. This is the century uh, dealing with them. And so finally it comes down to, to uh, the century coming back and he says, sir, he wants you, the senior person to come out. He wants to talk to the senior person here. So I said, okay, okay, I'm gonna walk out there and I want one person to the right 45 degrees and out of the headlights and another person to the to the left 45 degrees and out of the headlights I want you about a hundred yards away don't be visible and I'm gonna walk up and towards them in the headlights and if I drop you kill him and the Marines looked at me and said oh yes sir I said I mean it. If I drop, I want him dead. I was taking a risk, and I'm prepared to take that risk. I think that kind of, that event set the stage in my, in my command. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was born in Los Angeles, California, and, uh, 1954, and I grew up in South Los Angeles, and uh, went uh, all the way through high school, and actually junior college at uh, Los Angeles City College, and then, then, uh, then from there I went to University of Washington and played football there. When and why did you decide to join the Marine? Uh, that's an interesting story because the reason I joined the Marine Corps was uh it was a whim really i just uh i had i had gotten gotten a little injured and uh the school was was really gracious enough to give me another year to ensure that i could finish my degree but during the summer i i just got got hurt and um or prior to the summer i was hurt and it was it was really an injury that carried over from the previous season and so I was kind of depressed about that. I was honestly, I just didn't didn't feel like I didn't know what it was going to be like to go back to school and not play football. I'd played football so so many years, and so uh, one day I was walking walking downtown, and there was a marine re marine recruiter standing there, and uh, I just uh, he and I started talking. Next thing you know, he said he. Um, he asked me if I wanted to, uh, if I would be willing, wanted to join the Marine Corps. And I said, nah, you know, I don't know. And uh, he says, well, if I can get you, if I can get it, get you out in about a week or so, or within two weeks, would you, would you go? I mean, I just thought about it and I said, well, I guess so. Yeah, I didn't think much more on it. And, uh, of course, I'm thinking the traveling that I was doing was like a pretty much a weekend. We'd fly someplace, play football, and come back. And so I'm thinking, hey, here's an opportunity to take off for a weekend maybe and <laughs> come back. And uh, it wasn't quite that naive, but uh, it, it seemed temporary to me. And so I went ahead and uh, and, dis and signed up, and, the, and I signed up for for a combat arms bonus and uh, taking that combat arms bonus in reflection why I took it was I didn't really have a plan on what I wanted to do in the Marine Corps and that was the biggest bonus they had so I just took that and uh, joined the Marine Corps went through boot camp showed up at boot camp and realized about five minutes after I got off the bus that maybe this wasn't a good idea and uh, it went from, went from there to the realization that the, the quickest way out of this mess was to just do it and get it over with. And uh, 
and it kind of evolved from that. So um, I ended up in artillery. We used to call ourselves cannon cockers, and uh, and so I, you know, I would carry the ammo to the, and um, and then after you got a little experience, they put you on the gun, and of course when I when I showed up at the artillery uh, at the artillery regiment. I didn't realize it, but people were looking at me and, oh, here's a big guy, we'll make sure he goes into this, this unit. So I ended up in a, it, with eight inch howitzers. And eight inch howitzers, the, the rounds are about 200, 208 pounds. And it's interesting, even after all these years, I remember exactly that weight. <laughs> and, and so um, and the, the first job I had in artillery was, uh, was uh, the ammo man for an eight inch howitzer. So it was my job to, to unpack the rounds and stage them. And then as they were needed, get, put them on a loading tray and carry them or drag them over to the, um, to the howitzer to be uh, shot. And so um, it, was a, it was a physical, physical task for a guy who, who was pretty close to, who realized that uh, he only had a couple of classes to complete his degree, but he decided to do this instead. So it's a humbling moment for me, but uh, and I enjoyed it just the same. So at this point, are you still thinking, do my time, get out, or are you eyeing an officer's track at this point? Um, actually, actually, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, I'm just going to get out, but I want to get, I'm going to finish my degree first. That's the most important thing, and I, I'm just still. I wasn't real clear at the time when I, whether or not, I didn't even really understand what an officer was until I got into the Marine Corps, honestly. Didn't know much of difference between enlisted and an officer once and, and, and then, even then I was aware there was a difference because I was taught in boot camp, the rank structures and that sort of thing. Um, I, I completed my four years because I was in, uh, at night I completed my degree, so I got I, I got my degree before I, a um, couple years before I actually left, finished my enlisted time. I finished my enlisted time, went back to Seattle to live. Uh, I joined the uh, joined the reserves there, and um, once I was in the reserves. After a couple of months, I started thinking about it, the fact that if I'm going to stay in the reserves, I might as well get a commission. So that was the first time I really seriously thought about, about a commission was when I was in the reserves. Let's fast forward a little bit to 1990 and the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq. Where are you at this point, and what are you thinking when you hear that news? Uh, yeah, I just finished. Um, the, ironically, I left um, Paris Island gone to 29 Palms and uh, why I left for 29 Palms was because because um, for one my my the commander that I worked for guy by the name of Colonel Nunley he had he called he had called around to try to negotiate a, a job for me as a, a company commander and as a, one of the things that I appreciated was he and I were kind of former football players and we kind of saw saw a lot of a lot the same way and he says hey you know I really think you just need to need to go to a camp command I don't think I don't want you in a you know in a staff waiting and that sort of thing so we'll he, he kind of pulled some strings called some people and made a call it a verbal handshake that if I went to 29 Palms, which was a place that nobody really wanted to go, and went to LAVs, which is a unit within 29 Palms that nobody really wanted to go, I could have a company. And I get there and I, yeah, I did get a company because there were, there were like three officers there. And uh, one, and, uh, one was a uh, uh, friend of mine, Colonel Powers, but uh, he's there. And he's he's short officers. He was happy to have a have another officer show up. He, I get the company, and uh, we're out in the field training, getting ready to make a deployment. And we're about two months. We're the lead platoon to redeploy back to uh, 
Okinawa. And um, next thing you know, we hear that um, I'm literally out in the field training and I'm notified that that we need to prepare for deployment to, to uh, Saudi Arabia. That, of course, became known as Operation Desert Shield, which lasted from August till mid-January 1990-1991. What were your main priorities during those months leading up to the actual conflict? It, that, it's kind of, that whole time, main priority is to, to be ready and to continue to train. So in about, so within that six month period, we trained literally every day. I think I had a ratio of something like, something like uh, three days of day training and one night training event. And we literally trained. And, uh, and one of my goals, and, you know, at least in, in, in terms of analogous description of where I wanted the company to be was to, uh, yeah, I, to compare it to the uh, motorcycles the, the the motorcycles in a parade, you know, the the ones they they could could weave in and out of each other and and uh, and maneuver and with such cohesion and sequence until literally it just seemed like they were almost operating on their own. Well, that was that was that was kind of the description I gave to the troops about what how I wanted to see it, and we we literally worked on it and became, I was so very, very proud because literally they were that good. I mean, we just, I felt as if we were, we could, we were like, like the motor, the motorcycles you see in a parade. And, um, and in preparation for that, and you know, we obviously we did live training. Uh, we practiced, uh, practiced reloading just uh, running out of ammunition, how, how, how to feed ammunition quickly. We learned how, we learned so much in doing that, learned, learned how to specifically stow ammunition so that, so that all you really had to do was immediately just grab the top of the, the links and just shove it into the gun. You didn't have to maneuver or manu maneuver the ammo around just to get it uh, fed in. We, we practiced so many things that we, we actually Developed most um, uh, most of the LAV, what I consider most of the LAV operational um, SOPs for for its time. We developed them right then and right there during that six month period because the LAV was so new in our in our inventory, and we and we had nothing but quality time by ourselves to train and run through every potential scenario I could think of and they could think of and, uh, and then rehearse a reaction to it. And, um, and uh, in doing so, uh, it just got to be, we were just that good. Just simply put, I just believe that, that uh, the company was just that good. And uh, it was all from practice. It wasn't it wasn't because I was so much smarter than anybody else or anything else. It was just the consolidated, the coordinated, the synchronized effort of all of us uh, just made it th made us that good. And my job, <clears throat> I I always wanted to. I always told people, my job is to fulfill a role. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the leader per se. I'm not. I'm not the commanding officer per se. What I am is a role player. One night we're out, um, we're out in the middle of the desert. Out, I mean, literally, a hundred miles from anything, anything. You know that uh, Saudi Arabian desert is nothing but rolling sand for like hundreds of miles. We're out there, and the, and out in the distance, out in the distance, and we we spot a vehicle driving across the desert with its headlights on and, and this is mid in the middle of the night it's actually a very dark night so we can see this these headlights a long way and it's coming towards us and they're coming towards us and we're like and people and we got sentries out and we're the unit is in a coil and um, so finally it, it's for sure they're coming 
So I said, rather than just shoot <laughs> the vehicles in the, in the dark, I'm not going to do that. But I said, uh, I want people to stop them and turn around and tell them to go away. So, so we interdicted them down, essentially down the, down the road. You know, but I don't know, maybe 500,000 meters from where, from our position. Turns out it was a Saudi Arabian highway patrol or something, but they're out there and they were um, a guy. A guy show, drives up and he's he's claiming there was an accident somewhere on the highway and he wanted to look at the all the vehicles and ensure that that the vehicle one of our vehicles weren't wasn't involved in this accident and of course that's ridiculous we're not gonna you're not coming on you know and um so he started insisting on this and of course i'm not this is the century uh dealing with them and so finally it comes down to to uh the century coming back and he says He's, sir, he wants you, the senior person, to come out. He wants to talk to the senior person here. So I said, okay. I said, you know, and it's, it's dark, headlights out there. And, uh, there's, and we're literally in the dark as far as they're concerned. I said, okay, okay, I'm going to walk out there, and I want one person to the right, 45 degrees, and out of the headlights, and another person to the to the left, 45 degrees, and out of the headlights. I want you about 100 yards away. Don't be visible, and I'm going to walk up and towards them in the headlights. And if I drop, you kill him. And and the Marines looked at me and said, "Oh, yes, sir." I said, "I mean it." If I drop, I want him dead. And he's, yes, sir, we got it. And he looked at me, and I walked into the headlights. The point was, the point is this. If, if, I, if, if I, I was taking a risk, and I'm prepared to take that risk, but if, if, they, got, if they kill me as I'm walking through, when I'm walking in that light, they're not going to see you, but I want to make sure that the person who kills me dies. And, you'll, and you know the, you know how to handle the rest. I think that kind of, that event set the stage in my, in my command. And I think they knew who I was at that moment. For those of us old enough to remember, uh, General Schwarzkopf explained after the fact what the plan was. There was the feigned amphibious assault, right. draw in the Iraqi forces, ground troops come in and crush them from behind. What unit was yours and what was your responsibility in that? Um, how things have played out, I was with uh, something called, task, a unit called Task Force Shepherd. We were kind of, we were the, um, we were the um, screening force that, uh, that was more or less a mechanized, more con mechanized advanced element for the um, for the 1st Marine Division. Ironically, as things have played out, um, my company got peeled off to, to uh, provide direct security for the 1st for the Marine Division uh, forward CP. Uh, the f uh, and um, so, so the role that we ended up playing was, uh, was the... Uh, the security f element for the for the command group and General Myatt, who just who was a commanding general at the time for First Mardiv, was not one for operating from the rear. His you know he wanted to be he wanted to be up front so he could see what's going on and direct direct uh, his operation from from the front. Um, that's kind of philosophically the way Marines like to do things. I know why, because when you give orders, you're, you're giving them from the front. You really know what, what you see because you see it. And, uh, and you're actually uh, directing people in, in, terms of, in terms of your position. You're directing them 
to be in places that you know in in relationship to to you which is i think it, it gives a, it gives people confidence they know exactly you know they really know that you're not in the back hiding that's who you do you're actually there to uh to lead so but we ended up being the cp C security he actually pushed the forward cp up in front of the uh the uh the rest of the division and so we ended up in this position where um where uh, the um we were next to a oil field oil field started you know it was started burning it was burning pretty heavy but the it but as it was burning the smoke accumulation was was kind of starting to hang mostly because there probably wasn't that much wind but it, as it started to hang it just got darker and darker and uh, it kind of felt like even at, in the middle of the day it felt like it was night um, as we were there um, I didn't I'll admit that when I got assigned there it was, it was the last thing I wanted to do I felt like you know the Marines had worked. We had, we were we were literally the first LAV uh, company to hit the ground in Saudi Arabia, like eight months prior, and and I and quite frankly, I felt as if we were being relegated to to Division CP as opposed to you know taking advantage of our experience that we we had on the ground, and maybe there was some truth to that. But you know, it it didn't matter because I I think that um, as luck would have it, as the, as as things played out, we ended up at the division CP. Um, the unit was um, we had to deal with an attack from um, um, a mechanized brigade equivalent, which was roughly 50 to 60 armored vehicles. Uh, coming out of the oil field, and uh, and I had I had broken I I had my company had broken up into a, we had basically two platoons still sitting at the uh, at the CP and the other platoon was was still still with the with the battalion, so we had to deal with uh, a mechanized mechanized brigade with two platoons worth of LAVs. It um, took a lot of maneuvering, took a lot of synchroni synchronized actions with helicopters, and uh, and uh, the timing with the uh, um, that we had worked out to to make this work. And the irony is, I really wasn't sure if it was going to work, but uh, as we started getting attacked, I started realizing that we we're probably we're getting about to get overwhelmed or we could get overwhelmed and the division cp was right behind us so we really couldn't leave and so rather than sit and get overwhelmed i, I told told the told the marines you know, over the radio that we're going to we're going to reset ourselves and attack as soon as their weapons were loaded they'd give me the code word which was set once i had everybody set we positioned and I said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna counterattack. And I remember my gunner, I mean my my driver, who was a, I mean my VC, excuse me, he was a good guy. And of course, we were kind of kind of a personality personality driven, even our in our little LAV. He comes in the as I after, right after I beat, briefed everybody on the attack. He comes in the uh, intercom and he says, okay, now we're gonna die. You know, <laughs> and, and my response was, "Shut the f up," <laughs> and and, uh, and I didn't use the the letter. But anyway, um, and uh, it was almost like that's that's the humor that you have, you know, because you really don't know what's going to come next. And so then we uh, we started attacking, and the irony is, as we set ourselves and went to an attack. The um, the Iraqis coming out of the oil field were in what what we call a um, 
in a linear formation. They're just kind of one after another kind of thing. And so what they were trying to do, as we as soon as they realized that we were attacking them, they tried to do do a deploy into an assault formation. In other words, they're they're one after another, and what they wanted to do was reorganize themselves so they can get all their weapons forward and they and they'd be uh, side by side. We caught them in that transition, and we went right up their right up their uh, their linear formation, literally, as they were trying to pull out. And I and I remember thinking, I remember thinking while we we're doing that. After all the training that we went through, I knew how difficult it was to transition from a from a uh, from a linear formation to a essentially to an assault formation or to to spread yourself out, and to make that transition is not easy to do, and and I could tell by how they were moving that what the commander was dealing with. What he was actually doing was he was trying to describe to each of his elements how he wanted them, how he was envisioning them to, to, to deploy. And they were trying to deploy, and we were attacking, going right up their, their formation. And I could, I, you know, I, I could just see it. We were just, we're, you know, in other words, our decision was faster than theirs. And, uh, and I thank God that we... We had rehearsed like that. Now the the CG, the commanding general at the time, was as luck would have it, he was he could see this and how we synchronized the aircraft during that counterattack, and he thought he'd never seen anything like that. He says, "I've never seen, never seen synchronized." And, and the Marine Corps does this, and that's what we do, but he's never seen it done so so well synchronized. Well, you know. I guess it's you know it's easy to be real really well synchronized when you do nothing but rehearse for six months, but but um, but uh, that's how it played out. I remember, like I say, watching a unit. The way they were deploying was like we would we were deploying. It was like we were de the way we were deploying at the first week or two of being in Saudi Arabia, we would have, that would have been how we would have done it six months ago. So, so literally, it was just being able to make the decision faster and, and execute the decision faster. Amazing. And for that, the Navy Cross. Yeah. And, and um, I think one of the things that a lot of people kind of took, at least when they were doing the, um, doing the award and as I read it, one of the things that was taken out of that was, you know, that in order to make it easy for everybody in, to orient, it was all, you know, it, and also to give everybody confidence, it's, it was necessary to position my, you know, my vehicle and to be in a position where we always had to be, I always had to be in the lead position and they oriented themselves off my vehicle. So, so I think that, that in always in interpreting that, the, you know, I, I say that, you know, they look at it and say, okay, there he is leading the way. Well, yeah, but you know what? About the, about the most scary part about my job was leading the way, taking the first step, and I'm hoping that everybody is following me. Yeah, because because the scary part is, that to be confident, you just can't look back. You take off and you go. And and uh, and the Marines never let me down.